I welcome those who are gathered in the sanctuary this evening, as well as those who are worshiping virtually. Good Friday is a day of solemn sadness. It is always so. Thinking about the suffering of Christ, the cruel cross upon which he hung and died, carries a darkness that can be felt in our very souls. There's a certain repulsion in the tragic events of the day. Yet it is essential that we not overlook this day. It must never get lost between the passion of Palm Sunday and the victory of Easter. It is important that we remember that it was the Son of God who died there on the cross. It is essential that we see and feel the darkness over which Easter is the victor. Tonight, before we hear the alleluias of Easter, we need the courage that comes from standing together in the depths of Christ's story, of our story. We will see and hear and feel the darkness of it. We know the rest of the story. We know the joy and the victory of Easter that is coming. But when we look up at the cross, what do we see? Is there anything good in it? Is there any beauty to be seen tonight? Come, let us behold the Christ of the cross. I invite those who may comfortably do so to stand for the call to worship. We gather to worship God under the shadow of the cross. Like Jesus, let us follow faithfully in God's way. Let us offer God our worship and our lives.
invite you to remain standing as we pray together in unison. God of all creation, we come to you out of our need. Often we are overwhelmed by the darkness of suffering. We know what it is to be anxious over uncertainty and to grieve loss. As we behold the cross, we are reminded that our human needs are met with power of your unceasing love and grace. Draw us to the cross and let us see the presence of your grace and promise offered to us as Christ emptied himself in love. Assure us that you are with us and that your mercy sustains us in our darkness. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture reading this evening is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. If, therefore, there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also 
for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This past Sunday, I was sitting in my study after the Palm Parade, trying to catch a break before morning worship began, and my phone rings. It was Elsa calling me from the youth Sunday school class. Can you come to our class for a minute? We have a question for you. So much for catching a break. Whenever a Sunday school class has to phone a friend and you are the friend, the pressure is on, especially if it's the youth class. They always have some good questions. I started down the hallway reviewing in my mind everything I knew about anything they might have a question about. Suddenly, the old tapes were preempted by reason. Forget it. It could be anything. Just walk in with as clear a mind as you can and see what happens. It's your only hope. The pressing question posed by Allie was this. If Jesus was crucified on Friday, why is it called Good Friday? Shouldn't they call it Bad Friday? Now that's a good question about Good Friday. So I started with the best explanation I could come up with. I said it wasn't originally called Good Friday, just like the night Jesus was born wasn't originally called Christmas. Or the morning he rose from the tomb wasn't originally thought of as Easter. When it happened, the crucifixion would have been called Bad Friday by the friends of Jesus and by Jesus. But it depends, I said, on how you look at it over time, whether it remains bad or it can be seen as good. If you look at the crucifixion, and see how Jesus lost everything. His followers, his dignity, his freedom, even his life. It would still be a bad Friday. But if you look at everything that Jesus gave that day, grace and love and hope and comfort and even forgiveness, well, then it becomes Good Friday. On this Good Friday, Let's look again at the cross and see everything that Jesus gave, how he emptied himself. Let's see the crucifixion for what it means to follow Jesus and have the same attitude in ourselves. One of the resources that we used in the Lenten study, and it might have been the one that gave me the original inspiration for the theme about dance, was a devotional guide written by Ray Buckley entitled, Hard to Dance with the Devil on Your Back. In it, he shares a story about a Native American dancer who epitomizes how Jesus emptied himself. I want to share that story with you. As you listen, let the imagery of this story add insight to the familiar story of the crucifixion and let it call us to have within ourselves the attitude of Christ who emptied himself. Dancing with holes in your moccasins. There was a large circular patch of bare ground in the middle of a field. It had been used so often that the dirt was compacted, packed in on itself. 
On the surface was fresh dust, as if the earth was shedding her epidermis. Grass rarely grew there, only a few tufts here and there, bravely taking a stand. Around the perimeter was a brush arbor, posts connected by poles on the top, over which had been laid freshly cut boughs. They formed a circle around the area, sentinels providing shade from the sun. The dance circle had been swept clean. No one had crossed over it, everyone choosing instead to walk around the circle as was proper. The crowd had gathered under the arbor, extending far behind it. By the time the drum began to play, the people had been there for a long time. They rose to their feet as an eagle feather staff was carried into the dance circle, following the outside of the arena. So a small group of veterans entered carrying the colors of their country, their feet moving to a step far older than the country itself. He was the first dancer. Those closest to him could smell the sweet grass and sage on his hair and clothing. From the first step into the sacred circle, his body moved with the drum song. Every step, once planned and practiced, was now second nature to the spirit of the dance. The brooch in his hair, made of the guard hairs of a porcupine, moved as he turned his head, the tips fanning in precision with the two eagle feathers. Tied to his hip were two outstretched eagle wings, forming a bustle, catching a wind from the dance, and moving as if still in flight. There was grace in the strength of his dance and exuberance in the control. He had not, had he not been the first dancer, his footprints might have gone unnoticed. As he danced, moving as a prairie chicken moves, Careful steps placed upon the ground, creating the breeze that was caught on the feathers he wore. His feet left marks on the swept earth. There was something different about the footprint, something that made the print recognizable to the other dancers. In the center of each moccasin print, along the ball of the foot, was a large circular impression, worn there by many steps over many years. He was dancing with holes in his moccasins. Around the circle, the dancers moved until they reached the middle and turned outward, the spiral of life moving upon itself and back again. Occasionally, another dancer would acknowledge the first dancer lifting a dance fan or touching a piece of dance regalia. It was much more than a greeting. Throughout his life, he had noticed a young man who didn't have the resources for something beautiful, and he would spend the winter making something to give to him. He would know of an elder with a need and quietly pass something into his hand while he passed. To a young woman, he would give a beaded knife sheath, or with others, drop money at the feet of someone being honored. In gentle, small ways, so as not to seek attention, he would place the gifts in the hands of others with a nod, saying, in effect, I made this for you. It's for your dance. Years later, as they passed in other places, they would touch the gifts lightly and keep dancing. I'm wearing your gifts, they seemed to say. In the tradition of meticulous maintenance of traditional things, the holes were not neglect. They were not signs of carelessness hidden where none could see. The dancer could feel them with every step. Every step brought his foot upon the ground, striking the earth with his flesh. He was reminded of those who could not dance. He was reminded of his people who were unable to dance or who did not have the resources for the materials or a family member with the skill. To dance with holes in his moccasins was a way to remember who he was, 
a way to remember that dancing was not about beauty or ability, but about choosing to dance. Dancing was about stepping out, touching the earth, and those around you. Dancing was about giving away. Sometimes gathered around the bed of someone who was ill, my grandmother would sit for hours saying nothing with her hand resting on the hand of the sick person or on his arm or her arm. She would sit quietly while he or she slept, simply touching the person. There was a communication in the silence and awareness of the other's spirit. She believed in the touch even when there were no words. This understanding of touching and giving away is the spiritual stream that flows through many native cultures. It is what makes us human beings, not in the sense of humanitarianism, but in the sense of living as a creator intends. To choose to live another way slowly erodes the spirit of our lives until we pull away from God and what God created. In a real sense, we become alone. The message of God through Jesus is never aloneness. God not only touches us, but allows us to touch God. The untouchables are embraced. The outside is brought in, and God chooses to become vulnerable. God gives away. In the person of Jesus, we see God dancing with holes in God's moccasins. We are not alone, nor can we be. We are meant to dance together. So many years had passed, and still each year at the annual powwow, thousands of Native people gathered from across the western United States. As the dancers entered the circle, the crowd stood. While snow fell outside, the procession of beautifully attired dancer, dancers entered the Colosseum. Eagle feathers moved with the dancers. I waited to see them dance, as I did every year in many different places. It was after the grand entry, after everyone else danced into the arena, that I saw him. As in times past, he moved in a clockwise fashion, Every movement of his body was measured and planned as if he no longer needed to think about it. He had become the dance. As one becomes part of a second language, you no longer need to translate. He moved his head to the right as a prairie chicken moves its head. There was the movement to shake the bustles on his arm and to move the eagle feathers on his head. One could almost hear the bells and see the dance stick that should have been in his hand, but they weren't there. They were gone. Over the years, he had given the eagle feathers away, the bustles that he once wore in competition had been given to someone else. The beadwork now adorned another dancer. The dance stick was now carried by another. All of the beautiful adornments were no longer there. His head was ornamented with silver hair. He didn't now enter the arena in competition, but just to dance. In a starched white shirt, black trousers and moccasins with holes in the bottoms, he danced having given everything else away. Around the circle in that place and in many different places, others danced wearing his gifts. As God enables us, we dance. As God gives to us, we are able to give to others. Because the one who is truly the greatest has become the lowest, we are able to give. We are able to take the gifts of God not as adornments, but as things to be given away. It is grace. Grace to dance. Grace to give away. Amen.
as we turn our focus upon the cross of Christ, let us see there the power of God's grace given away that seeks to forgive us, transform our lives, and renew our souls. I invite those who may comfortably do so to stand for the prayer of confession as we pray in unison. Gracious God, we see power and privilege as something to be held on to at all cost. Seldom do we have the mind of Christ who emptied himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Forgive us and give us, we pray, the attitude of Christ. Amen. We stand under the cross. We look up. What do we see? What do you see? Let us see ourselves forgiven in love and ready to empty ourselves.
the shadow of agony. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. There came, therefore, a voice out of heaven. I have both glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The multitude, therefore, who stood by and heard it, were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of the world has been cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. the shadow of unshared vigil. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here with me and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. He came back. And he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. The shadow of betrayal and arrest. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I shall kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately he came to Jesus, and he said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. And they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck a slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then shall the Scriptures be fulfilled, that it must happen this way? 
At that time, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a robber? Every day I used to sit at the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. The shadow of denial. And having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. And after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him too. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I did not know him. And a little later, another saw him and said, You're one of them too. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And after about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he is a Galilean too. And Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, a cock crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before a cock crows today, you will deny me three times. He went outside, and he wept bitterly. The shadow of verdict. And early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation. And binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him up to Pilate. And Pilate questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? And answering, he said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priests began to accuse him harshly. And Pilate was questioning him again, saying, Do you make no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? And Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was astonished. Now at the feast, he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. And the man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The multitude went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. And Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priests had delivered him up because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the multitude to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. And answering again, Pilate was saying to them, Then what shall I do with him? whom you call the king of the Jews. And they shouted back, Crucify him! But Pilate was saying to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! the shadow of the cross. And the soldiers took him away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort. And they dressed him up in purple, and after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they kept beating his head with a reed, spitting at him and kneeling and bowing down before him. And after they had mocked him, they took the purple off him and put his garments on him. They led him out to crucify him. And they pressed into service a passerby coming from the country, Simon of Cyrene, 
the father of Alexander and Rufus, that he might bear the cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. The shadow of death. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things already had been accomplished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. <coughs> Through the darkness. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened, and they said, Truly, this was the Son of God. <laughs> 